Hey everyone, Mecha here with some mini pitfalls. In this series, I review gameplay situations in Fire Emblem so everyone can learn from them and become a better player. The last, and by the way, the first one I did was ages ago, and I thought it was about time I did something else. So for this one, we're going to take a look at the combined FE7 and FE8 draft race that I played last Sunday. Me and three players got together to see who could get through both games the fastest with a drafted team. In other words, we took turns picking units from a giant pool of FE7 and FE8 units until we all had a team of 10. And then we raced through FE7 and FE8 within one stream. The whole race lasted 6 hours and it was a lot of fun. And if you want to, you can rewatch the VOD on my channel, or you can watch a live commentary by Donnan and Raisins on Donnan's channel. I will make sure to link both down below. So. Today I'm going to review my own play and highlight a couple of moments where I think I might have made a mistake. I'm only going to discuss my own gameplay, which is the top left screen when all four games are visible, since it's the easiest to commentate from my own perspective. I will do my best to contextualize this review with knowledge about the draft race metagame when needed, but to make this video not too long, I might not always be able to do this. I do plan on making a basic draft racing masterclass video at some point, but that said, I think a lot of the lessons from this video will be applicable to any kind of playthrough in Fire Emblem, or even any video game. So, during the drafting, I made one big mistake. I picked Tana Ross for the third, fourth round. I was fourth pick. Uh, Tana was the correct pick, but I don't think I should have taken Ross. Basically, for all of FE8, you only need the three units like Erika, Ephraim, and Murr, then a combat unit with eight moves like Seth or Franz or a flyer like Vanessa or Cormag, and then another combat unit, usually referred to as a secondary or an infantry. Often these are axe users, think Dazla, Garrick, Garcia, Ross, and Dazla. All of them have various pros and cons in availability, combat prowess, and how much time it takes to train them, and really every team kind of wants one of them. The reason I thought Ross was my best pick at the time are chapters 5, 6, and 7. During that time, Seth is banned from use by all players, including whoever drafted him, which is me. Chapter 5 in particular, I was not comfortable doing with Erica alone. It can be alleviated by picking Mulder. Uh, Donda made a very good strategy that I can do that clears the chapter quite quickly, but it foregoes recruiting Joshua for his killing edge as well as the secret book village. Neither of those are essential, and the real reason I was I was also just not familiar with Erica for chapter 6. Like, chapter 7 I can deal with, but I knew Erica Solidaire was at least slower than using Ross, because Ross can be a pirate and walk across the river. After chapter 7, I am able to use Seth again, so Ross becomes less essential, unless I want to use him as my secondary combat unit, like I described before. However, uh, I was also not very happy with Seth as my primary combat unit, and Ross as my secondary, since a lot of my FEA practice with was, was with the Flyers, Cormac and Vanessa. All the racers talked a lot during the preparations, and we did like mock drafts to try and see roughly what the teams would be. And in each of those, Heath was picked first. However, it turns out that actually everyone was planning to pick an FE8 Flyer first, since generally everyone thought that they made a bigger difference in the Flyer and FE7. And since I was the fourth pick, that meant I was left without a good Flyer to take, like, the only remaining flyer that was left to pick for FE8 was Tana, because Cormag and Vanessa were both taken, and Tana requires a hefty amount of time to train. I think the estimate is about 7 minutes of Tower of Volney grinding just to become competitive. However, since I was so much more familiar with the flyer strategies than the Paladin strategies, particularly for Scorched Sand, I was more than considering just training her up anyway. With Seth and a trained Tana, I would have all the combat I need for mid-game, but it still leaves open that gap for FE8's early game, which is what I picked Ross for. However, in hindsight, I should have left it open for a bit and either did a, did a denial pick for FE8 or just a better FE7 unit. Believe it or not, I actually have almost everything I need for FE7 with just Florina and the free units. Once Florina is trained, she does 90% of the work, and almost any other amount of picks cannot make that remaining 10% go any faster. There were a couple of FE7 units that I considered picking here, like Isadora and Oswin and Matthew, or even an FE8 one like Colm. I knew they were better in a vacuum, but either within the context of a Florina run, or within the context of my own game knowledge, I didn't think they were more fitting than Ross. Still, I think the right move in the end here would have been to pick one of those units like Isadora, and then get Ross, Garcia, or even Mulder later. And especially knowing what I know now, and having seen Gein play the early mid game with basically just Erika and Ephraim, I think I'd be able to make it work without significant time loss. Another reason I was afraid to do it that way was if Erika got RNG screwed, uh, particularly in strength, that can be really scary with Erika. 
So that's my explanation for the Ross pick, which I think was my biggest mistake in the race overall. I think I could have waited and he probably would have made it back to me in a later round. And if not, then Garcia probably would have. Uh, Garcia went really late into the draft. And with the knowledge I have now, I also could have just not picked anyone and I would have been fine. Uh, I'll go over the rest of my draft real quick just to explain what my team is. So the draft comes back to me later and others have picked all these units that I mentioned so I'm left with some less optimal options. I end up taking Wrath here who does a lot of the same things that Isadora does. So he does like all the mounting duty that I need late into the game. And I also took FE8 Dussel. At this point I didn't really see many units that would be very useful for me personally in FE7 or FE8. But I do think Dussel would be useful for other people to have so it was a denial pick. I talked earlier about the secondaries or infantries, and of these, Dusso is generally considered the best since he requires no training, but still does a couple of things that the others do not. Dusso was available from chapter 11 onwards, uh, at least if you're playing FM route, which almost everyone was, uh, whereas Garrick and Dawslight joined a bit later. Uh, Garcia and Ross joined earlier, but they also require more training, so you'd still lose time using them compared to Dusso. Uh, Dazla is pretty good, requires little training, but he also requires a speed ring to double anything, and even with it, he's still slower. Uh, Dussel also has A rank axes and can comfortably reach S rank when you're about to get the Garm uh, for an easy plus 5 speed bonus and huge damage, whereas Dazla needs serious attention to his axe rank to get Garm. He has B rank axes at base, so he has to like spam steel axes, which sucks. And Garrick, he'll probably never make it to S rank axes. So when it comes down to how much you invest versus how much you get in return, Dussel is the best. Uh, the reason I didn't pick him before is because I wanted to fill up that early game gap uh, with Ross, but everyone else focused mostly on FE7 this round, so when Dussel decided to come back to me, or when I decided to let Dussel come back to me, I was like, alright, I'll take it. In addition, I thought Dussel might come in handy once or twice in FE8 for me. There are situations where an extra combat unit adds reliability, although it does often come at the cost of some time, but I'll get into that when we're actually looking at the race itself. The last couple of picks aren't very interesting. I picked Dorcas and Urk uh, next round. Uh, Dorcas for the same reason that I picked him in the last FE7 race. Basically just to help Hector and Marcus across the river in Chapter 13 without losing time. And in addition, there are strategies in Chapter 17, Whereabouts Unknown, and Chapter 20, Dragon's Gate, where just the fact that Dorcas exists is helpful. He doesn't necessarily have to fight anything. Then I picked Urk since he joins with the Goddess icon, and you're only allowed to deploy Sarah to recruit him if you drafted either him, Sarah, or Priscilla. And since those two are already gone, I figured this was my last way out, and also Urk could help out with combat here and there. A unit with this very occasional combat utility is usually referred to as a flunky, by the way, which sounds very dismissive, but they're good units to have nonetheless, even if they don't save as much time, uh, but they are usually considered disposable. A nice thing with Urk that benefited me during the race is that he ended up fighting and killing a couple of enemies. This is helpful for chapter 27 actually, which has a route split. There's two variations, Jermay and Kenneth, and Kenneth is by far the, e the faster one, also the easier one. Uh, but if your hero cast users outlevel your guiding ring users, you get the Jeremy version and you incur a huge time loss since you have to route the map. In practice, that means that if your Dorcas or Bartrace use combat, you have to kill them off before chapter 27 to avoid going to the Jeremy version, since killing them negates their EXP gain. But since my Urk gained more EXP than Dorcas, I could go to Kenneth version without having to make Natalie a Widow. That said, I think Dorcas was a slight mistake. I should have taken low ones, since he can do that same chapter 13 strategy, but also provide 7 movements in other situations. I did not realize at the time that low one was still open for picking, since usually he is drafted way earlier. Lowen's spot in draft racing basically got taken by Fiora. Usually he was the one being paired with the pen team, but I should have seen that. <laughs> it would not have made a very big difference overall, but strictly speaking, Lowen is better than Dorcas, even if he's not being trained. And in the last round, I got Louise and Null. Louise was only really going to be helpful for Sands of Time, where she can fight some snipers and maybe the final chapter. Null was small mistake on my part, I think. I only picked him because I thought he might be useful in the Gorgon Egg chapter to kill eggs, or like either with him or with his summons, but given that I had so many FE8 combat units, I could have picked someone else here. I think Natasha or Moller would have been a better pick to heal my units in Chapter 5. Most FE7 units left over at this point could go unrecruited. Um, Elliwood, Rebecca and Will provide small benefits, but I think Urk and Dorcas were the only flunkies I needed for FE7. So that's it for the draft itself, and now let's talk about the race. And I need to say this up front, I am happy with the way the race went. Throughout the entirety of both games, I only had one big reset, which was Battle Before Dawn, and that was largely out of my control. I'll get into it later. Uh, other than that, pretty much every FE7 chapter and FE8 chapter went fine. 
Some of them were a bit slow, but no devastating resets. And in a long race such as this, I really think that was more important than trying to execute the fastest strategies possible. Particularly in FE8, I think almost every chapter could have been a minute faster, and that adds up, but a lot of the time I was being cautious, checking notes, making sure I wasn't doing any big chokes. Because, uh, you know, sometimes I do that. <laughs> that said, here are the seven biggest mistakes and time losses that I had. Uh, there's not an exhaustive list of mistakes, uh, but I think it's the most impactful ones and the most interesting to analyze right now. I don't want this video to be too long, which it probably will be anyway. So, uh, Florina support grinding. Florina is a very powerful unit in the mid to late game of FE7. Like, I picked her first for a reason. Uh, but in order to get there, she needs a lot of help. One way you can get her to up to par is by grinding up a support with Hector during chapter 16. The idea is that you get enough support points in her joining chapter to reach C support immediately, and then either you get enough to be on, uh, uh, you get enough to points to get her to be in turn one of chapter 17, or later if you want to shave some time, so you just get a bunch of adjacents throughout the game to eventually reach B support. I was going to do the instant B support, so I just put Florina and Hector next to each other, started mashing end turn and talking to chat and other racers while loosely keeping track of the turn count. But I overlooked something big. I needed to activate the C support in order to build points for the B support. There is no support point cap in FE7 like there is in FE6, like some people think, but in order to build support points towards B, you need to activate the C support. It just did not activate the C support between Hector and Florina until all the way after my intern spamming. They didn't build any points beyond C, so I never got my B support. Now Hector Florina is a light thunder support, meaning it provides full crit and defense and half avoid and attack. So instead of getting the plus 10 crit, plus 2 defense, plus 5 avoid and plus 1 attack from the B support, I was stuck with getting half of that. This definitely lowered my consistency in combat performance overall in the game. Now, uh, let's take a brief break from looking at mistakes, uh, like individual mistakes for a moment, and look at something general here. Uh, mistake categories. I think when you're looking at mistakes, I think it's also important to realize what kind of mistake it is, because that tells you how to fix it. Generally speaking, I think there are two kinds of mistakes, a lack of knowledge or a lack of execution. A lack of knowledge is usually a lack of preparation, not knowing a certain enemy's AI or not knowing their weapon, not knowing what tile to move a unit to to get the best results, not knowing what weapons or items to bring to a certain chapter. In an ideal world, you are prepared for every single scenario when playing Fire Emblem, not just draft racing, but any situation. If you know of everything the game can throw at you, then you will have the answer ready every time. But in the real world, that's not happening. You prepare for the most common scenarios, and hopefully you have the ability to improvise your way out of a bad but uncommon situation. I prepared for this draft race partially using practice and partially through watching other people play and sometimes writing down their strategies, particularly Don Don, since his are the most researched ones, especially for FE8. FE7 Florina, I definitely didn't have extensive notes for her, especially not for her training arc. I knew mostly how to train her up in Chapter 16, but the support grinding bit was a lack of mechanical knowledge on my part. I did not know before this race that you could not point points for a B support until you actually activated the C1. It's hard to point out exactly how much time this cost me, because it's a very small effect over the course of the game. I think it mostly just affected my consistency. Now, this is different from the next mistake I made, which is an execution error. I was in chapter 19 and my Hector reached Uhai, the boss of the chapter, and very fortunately, I got a critical hit on my first try, giving me what I think is the fastest chapter 19 clear in the race. Normally, Uhai can be a big pain in the butt between his high avoid and his crit rate with the killing edge, and his ability to attack at 1, 2 or 3 range, but I just got a free pass, and in my excitement, I did not pay enough attention when Uhai dropped his Ryan's bolt, and I simply decided to discard it. I did not realize at the time that I needed that Orion's Bolt to promote Wrath, and this is the only one you get for free. Thankfully, one of my viewers and fellow race enthusiasts, Use of Neon, pointed out that you can get the second Orion's Bolt in Chapter 24 by killing a bishop on the right side of the map. I had to improvise a lot to get it in what was otherwise going to be a pretty simple two-turn clear, so in the end it cost me time, but it wasn't a disaster. The reason I think it's important to distinguish between these mistakes is because the fix to an execution error is completely unhelpful to a fix in a lack of knowledge and vice versa. The knowledge I now have about how building support points works means I won't make that mistake again, so thanks to those who pointed it out to me. But someone giving me mechanical advice when I make an executional error is a bit of a pet peeve of mine. Like, imagine you're me and you discard the Orion's Bolt, and then someone tells you that Orion's Bolt is used to promote bow units if they're level 10 or higher, or that if you discard an item, it's unavailable in the future. 
However well-meaning that advice is, it's completely unhelpful and a bit irritating to hear because I'm an experienced Fire Emblem player, I know how those mechanics work, I just pressed the wrong buttons and didn't pay enough attention. This example here is a bit ridiculous, but there is an instance of this later. Uh, my next mistake was Florina's positioning in Crazed Beast. The idea of this little maneuver is that you stay out of the reinforcement zone around the fort on turn 1 to avoid a bunch of cavalier spawns. And the next turn you go inside of it, you drop Hector on one of the forts, and that allows him to seize the fort next turn without having to fight his way through 5 waves of 3 cavaliers. If I put Florina a little bit further to the right, I could have prevented her from facing a couple of the cavaliers already on the map and reduced her chances of death. My positioning here was mostly improvised and I didn't think enough about it in preparations, but Next time, I will know where to move her. For mine to survive, she needed to dodge like 3 ballistas in a row when she was at like 5 HP, which she fortunately did, but she could have died here and I would have had to replay 2 very long turns. In addition, I also should have bought a second Slim Lance for her to increase her avoid either on this turn or at least on Dread Isle. I broke my first and only Slim Lance, and alternatively, I could have just left her unequipped this turn by trading her weapons with Hector's and then trading them back next turn. Lastly, there is Battle Before Dawn. This one went wrong for everyone except Justin. What happened here, in my case, was that Jafar died before I could get to him, but not on turn 2, which is his most common death time. Mine died during the enemy phase of turn 3. Now, I knew just as everyone did, that when Jafar dies on turn 2, you just have to reset the chapter. Nothing can be done about it. You will not make it to Zephiel before the enemies do, that's just it. But I'd never seen him die on turn 3, and neither did Raisins or Don Don. I decided to press on in that attempt, since I had no idea if I would make it to Zephiel in time. It turns out that a Sword Reaver fighter had managed to avoid getting killed by Jafar, probably by dodging one of his attacks, and so that guy was able to want to kill Zephiel before Florina was able to actually make it to Zephiel. Uh, by the way, you might wonder why is Florina off in a corner fighting Ursula? That's the general strategy for this map. You kill Ursula on turn 4 to stop reinforcements from spawning. Jafar is usually able to hold off the enemies for long enough that Zephiel won't face enemies until you can make it to him. In fact, by getting to Ursula on turn 4, you fight some enemies that would start moving towards Zephiel if you didn't, so it actually decreases the odds of him dying. It's easy to say that this death was due to bad RNG on Jafar's part, and it probably was. But still, now I know that I should probably just reset on turn 4 if Jafar dies during turn 3 enemy phase, so in a way it's still a lack of knowledge on my part. It's also worth noting that I butchered something at the start of this map. In order for Florina to make it to Zephiel in time, or at least make it to Ursula, she needs to be danced by Ninian and go full speed ahead. If you leave Ninian in that position where she danced in on turn 1, she will die on enemy phase. And there's still a use for Ninian in Cargo Destiny, so to save her I drafted Wrath to get her out of the way. However, I did not properly memorize how to rescue her to safety even with an 8 move units. And even though I've seen people do it plenty of times with 7 move units, I still didn't know. So in both my initial attempts and my successful one, it looks pretty scuffed. And my units see a lot of combat that they really didn't need to. Uh, in my second attempt, at least I don't deploy Murnus, which was a slight improvement. Um, but still, my execution was not proper. Uh, but this was not an execution error, this was simply a lack of knowledge and I knew it when I was doing it. But I did not see a way in a moment to improve even knowing if I'm wrong the first time. Now, when you're making a mistake and you know it, it can sometimes be worth to figure out how to fix it. I could have used some kind of break to figure it out on the fly. This option didn't occur to me during a race. In fact, it only occurred to me when I was writing the script. And I thought of like looking it up, uh, how to do it, but it would lose me time, I thought. So in a way, that's an execution error of its own. Take a break to figure out how to do a strategy if you want to do a strategy properly in a reset. Other than Battle Before Dawn, I had no resets in FE7, other than maybe a couple of early ones, uh, like early in the chapter, and I got a pretty fast time of around two and a half hours. Not a personal best, but ahead of everyone else in the race to the point where I got into FE8 with a comfortable lead. Now for FE8, the Sacred Stones, I don't think I made a lot of errors worth highlighting, but there are a couple that I want to discuss. Again, this list is by no means exhaustive, but if I discussed every mistake I made, we'd be here forever. Uh, first one, I trained Tana for too long. The usual amount of grinding that she needs to do is two clears of the first floor. I was planning on only doing two, and heard later from the commentary that after those two, my Tana had the stats that she needed to for the rest of the game. Uh, particularly, she needs to hit a certain strength and speed benchmark in order to double and do significant damage to the chapter 10 boss with the Axe Reaver, uh, which allows you to end the chapter early instead of waiting it out. However, I went in for a third round of Valny since I wasn't sure if I hit that benchmark or not, and I think I felt like I was getting speed screwed. It is worth noting that I settled for only one entombed kill and retreated afterwards instead of staying for another enemy phase, so I did cut my time a bit short in that third attempt. Uh, that said, I think training Tana at all 
helped me a lot, mostly mentally. Uh, with perfect strategizing, I might have been able to get a faster time neglecting one of Tana or Ross, but using a trained Tana made my mid and late game strategies a lot more comfortable. With better knowledge though, I could have caught a lot of time between these two units, but I already went into that with the draft part. Then there's chapter 13. At this point, I had more units than I needed. I had Ephraim, a trained Tana, and I had Seth. I could do everything I needed to do with these three units alone. I still used Ross and Dusel in this map though, to pick up the slack if needed. Uh, but first off, deploying them alone was unnecessary, but I knew that. There were there to be idiot proof, um, or, or rather, idiot proof clear, might clear of the chapter. Uh, not to make it as fast as it could possibly be. I would lose every time I moved or thought about moving them, which probably adds up to maybe 30 seconds to a minute per chapter. Uh, but most of the time, I think I did a good job of ignoring them. For example, in Phantom Ship, a lot of these units just stood still and did nothing. However, I made one huge blunder in this map. I didn't send anyone to the right side, where Garrick is. I sent Tana through the middle to deal with Sun and Pegasus Knights, as you're supposed to, and then I sent like everyone else left or through the middle. I realized it part way through, and I started sending Ross to the right, but because I realized it late, a couple of enemies moved differently, and I ended up routing the map without being able to get the Talisman village. This Talisman would have been helpful for Murr later on to survive against Leon, since Leon is so strong, but she usually hits the threshold needed without it, and it would be completely my fault if I um, it would be completely my fault if I let myself get RNG screwed this way. If I really wanted it, I could have left Ross without a Hanex equipped on the last turn of chapter 13 and then visit the village, but and I probably would have had to fight an extra couple pirate reinforcements in this chapter, so I made a judgment call not to do that. Now, the last map that I want to talk about is good old Scorched Sand. This is a very treacherous map for draft racing. There are a lot of ways to screw it up. If you screw up even a little bit and you don't win before the end of turn 8, you face extra reinforcements that might cost you like 5 or 6 minutes cleaning them up. Or worse, you might end up with someone dying, and one of the most likely units to die is Erika, who causes the game over if she does. Erika is stuck in the middle of the desert, surrounded by enemies coming from all sides, including Wyvern Riders and Pegasus Knights with Weapon Triangle, and sometimes they even have Javelins for one to range. Without the right moves, you might get a game over, and if you're 15 minutes into an attempt, that's a big time loss. This map can decide an entire FV8 race by itself. I've been pretty bad at Scorch Sand myself, I'm known for choking it. I've had like 5 resets on it in a race before, it's terrible. Um, so at this point in the race, also not helping, I was tired. I've been playing for 4 hours, streaming for 5, and then more doing technical preparations for the stream. So I did everything I could to avoid a disastrous reset. I was going for the fast clear, but I was not going to risk a game over for it. However, even in that light, I still screwed up a bit. First of all, I made an execution error, not once, but twice. I moved my units at the bottom and then ended the turn, forgetting to move Erika. Not moving Erika results in complicated situations where death is likely and time loss is certain, so I just instantly hit the reset button both of the times I did this. Again, execution error. Telling me how to move Erika mechanically or something, or telling me how reinforcements work, that's not going to help me in this situation. This is just execution. Just be better at this. From there though, once I fixed that, the chapter went sorta of smoothly, but there were a couple errors worth pointing out still. I moved Ephraim through the bottom to kill Valter's army, and I sent Dusel and Seth along to clean up with him and maybe block some reinforcements. In hindsight, uh, it should have been just one of Seth and Dusel. The other one could have moved up and helped Ross out, who went up to fight Kalak's army. The south group did just fine where I sent them, but Ross really could have used the help. He was two shotting Kalak using the Sword Slayer, but he only doubled him when Kalak was using the Tomahawk. When Kalak switched to Silver Axe, though, he was no longer being weighed down, and I could only single hit him. So. First of all, Ross should have had the Garm. For this entire run, I basically had my unit's entire inventories written down for battle preparations to make sure they were equipped for every situation that they would be in, but somehow I overlooked bringing Garm to this chapter, and that's a weapon I just got. Uh, Garm would have given Ross the extra speed to double Kalak and greatly increase his odds of success. Um, second of all, I should have used the Hatchet to attack Kalak when he equipped the Silver Axe. It stops him from countering and forces him to switch back to the Tomahawk and he gets doubled again. I also could have used my bottom units to help Ephraim more against Falter. Uh, instead, I had Seth and Dusel block the forts from spawning reinforcements, but on turn 7, there are no cavalry reinforcements, and I kind of knew that, but I wasn't sure. Uh, but what I said I could have done is moved in to attack Falter, which would have been helpful since Ephraim wasn't able to land all his Dragon Spear hits. I ended up missing against Kalak too often to clear the map before turn 8, so I had to fight these reinforcements. Fortunately though, my units were in position to clear them almost right away, so I didn't lose as much time as I could have, but it was definitely necessary. Despite all this though, I think this was the fastest I ever cleared Squirt Stand in a draft race, so honestly I'm happy with it. I never had to reset beyond turn 1, and 
More importantly, if I ever play this race again, I will have a much better idea of what to do to improve my chances. And honestly, that's a really suitable note to end this on. Despite all these mistakes, I'm happy with my performance and the time I set. I got around 2 minutes or 2 hours and 30 minutes for FE7 alone. I got 2 hours and 50 minutes for FE8. So that's around 520 for both games. That's like, it's not perfect, but a perfect run of both of these games is a lot to ask for, especially when you also just want to have fun. But if you want to improve, I think being able to honestly look back at your mistakes and see not only what went wrong, but what kind of mistake you made and why, I think is so important. And that goes not just for a draft race, that's a bit like draft races are just a very specific, very niche thing within a niche video game franchise. But honestly, I think it goes for all video games, if not for all of life. Make sure you're able to look back at your mistakes and know how to fix them. Thanks for watching, everyone.